Well, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor uh, for me to speak here. It's been amazing to have this great uh, resource throughout the epidemic, and I hope we uh, keep it going long, long after. And I can't believe it took us so long to figure out that we could actually do this and all get together every week. And uh, so it's nice to see a lot of familiar names and faces. Um, please ask at any time, interrupt. Uh, um, I'd like to have as much as possible uh, a lively discussion. So, um, right. So I wanted to tell you about some things that I've been thinking about for the last many years uh, about the interaction between these two subjects, sphere packings and, and arithmetic groups. Um, but let me let me start at the very beginning. So it, don't, don't look at these, pretend you didn't see any of those pictures yet. So let's start at the very beginning since, uh, well, a number of you have seen uh, some version of something, but there's always new stuff to, um, uh, there's, there's lots of new stuff that I want to get to, but I can't assume that everyone's heard uh, me speak on this too often. So let's go back to the very beginning. So uh, recall, recall what an Apollonian circle packing is, Apollonian, classical Apollonian circle packing. Let's do a little review. Um, so, so this comes from the ancient Greek Apollonius. Apollonius was interested in uh, a general problem about tangencies. He, uh, he had a work called Tangencies, which uh, in fact was lost, um, but it, it spoke of taking three circles. Let's, let's already start with them being mutually tangent. So if these are your three circles, the Apollonian problem is to, um, is to with straight edge and compass, construct a circle that's tangent to the three given ones. And his theorem is that there's exactly two ways to do this. So these are the two solutions to the Apollonian problem. So, um, and uh, maybe I should mention, uh, so this is construct, construct tangent circles by straight edge and compass, of course, straight edge and compass. Um, his original method was lost, and uh, a method that used only the tools available to him was uh, rediscovered or invented anew um, in the 17th century or 16th century. Um, uh, actually, very recently, so if you, this is just uh, baby geometry, high school geometry. So Arthur Baragar and I uh, gave a construction, gave the, the, the currently best known construction. So. Uh, lowest number of moves, lowest number of moves construction. And we conjecture that this is the, the best possible construction. But anyway, that's just, that's just a, a, an aside. So um, once you can put in these tangent circles, you see you have another triplet of tangent circles and you can put more tangent circles into these. And uh, apparently this was first done by Leibniz so Leibniz constructed what we now call an Apollonian circle packing, which is this fractal in the plane. Um, this, you know, around 1700 or so. Um, and then somehow uh, people kept missing the, the number theory here. The number theoretic structure was uncovered by Frederick Soddy. So this is in the 1930s, maybe around 1936. He saw that there exist configurations, there exist configurations of these Apollonian circle packings of this with all what he called bends. Bends are the curvatures of a circle. But since we want to speak of uh, sphere packings, we'll, we'll uh, actually use the term bend because curvature can mean one over the radius squared. So the curvature of a circle is one over the radius of, of a circle or a sphere. Uh, there exist configurations of Apollonian circle packings with all bends integral, with all bends integral. So there's some strange number theory hiding inside it's this. The Apache. Sorry? <laughs> Was there a question or a comment? No, I thought I heard something. Okay. So, so just one example of that is what's being, is the first illustration here. So this is a classical Apollonian circle packing this is a, a circle of radius one over 18. So the radius of this is one over 18. The radius of this is one over 23 and so on. And so these numbers are um, the bends of the packing. 
Okay, any questions so far? So far, so good. Okay. Um, well, there, there were sort of two natural questions. Uh, question one, so if you, if you sort of see all these circles everywhere, um, if we want to uh, draw all the circles with bend at most a thousand or million, so what is the number of circles in a given packing P? So there exist configurations of this packing P. Uh, what's the number of circles in the packing with bend bounded by uh, some growing parameter X? In other words, uh, so we like sieve methods, but this is literally sifting out, putting a, a, a sieve that throws out all the circles that are too small. So circles whose, whose bends are greater than a million or a billion or a trillion. So what is the asymptotic growth rate of, uh, of this picture? This question was answered um, in a paper of uh, Owen and myself already a decade ago. It's hard to imagine and uh, made more precise by, by lots of authors including Min Li and Hio and Ilya Vinogradov and many, many others. Uh, the, the asymptotic formula here is, is uh, some constant that depends on the packing. The, the rate of growth is X to the Hausdorff dimension. So Delta is the Hausdorff dimension of the limit set of this packing. And this is some, some number 1.30 and so on. Uh, it's a number greater than one because the, this fractal contains circles. So of course the Hausdorff dimension is gonna be at least one. It's less than two because it sits inside the plane uh, and it's strictly less than two, which one can prove without too much work. And uh, these days we can prove this with a power savings error term, let's say plus big O of X to delta minus epsilon for some small epsilon. Okay, so, so these counting questions I sort of consider settled much less settled are questions about, okay, we see these numbers, we see these bends. So if our packing is integral, so we'll say a packing is integral, if all the bends are integers, which numbers arise? Which numbers, which numbers arise? So in our example above, the set of bends, this is the set of bends, contains, let's see, uh, what numbers do we see? 18, 23, 27, 35, 62, and so on. So this is just the list of numbers without multiplicity that we see. So this is 18, 23, 27, 35, and so on. And so there's this list of bends, infinite list of bends. And um, in a beautiful series of papers by Graham, the late Ron Graham, uh, Ligarius, Mallows, this was an AT&T group, Wilkes and Yan at Bell Labs before, uh, before Bell Labs closed down. So this starting about 20 years ago, uh, maybe 02 or 03, um, it was a long series of papers that was studying uh, the integral properties of bends. Um, Rishka is asking, is this unique? No, so there's a different set of bends. The, the set of bends is, uh, depends on which initial configuration you started with. So there are infinitely many. Um, there's, a so Apollonian packings, there's one Apollonian packing up to complex structure. It's conformally rigid. Uh, any one can be moved to any other by a Mobius transformation. But uh, over Q, there are infinitely many rational structures. And so each different Apollonian integral Apollonian circle packing gives rise to a different bend set. Yeah, so this is the set of, of bends of the packing, set of bends of the packing P. Um, so in our example, th these were the bends that we saw in, in the example up above. So Graham, Ligarius, Mallows, Wilkesian observed that there were some local obstructions here. There are local obstructions. You only saw certain residue classes, it turned out mod 24. Um, so, so let's, we define, we define N, we say N is admissible, admissible for a give, for a fixed packing P if N is in the set of bends mod Q for all Q. Are we interested in characterizing B 
for a fixed packing? No, we want to know for a fixed packing. So given uh, fix, fix a packing, and then what set of bends will you see for that packing? Yeah, thanks. Please keep the questions coming. Uh, so definition, a, a number is admissible if it's in the set of bends mod Q. Of course, if you're not in the set of bends mod Q for some Q, then obviously you're not in the set of bends. And the question is, to what extent is there a local global principle? So uh, their conjecture, their conjecture. Uh, so this is the, let's, let's give this a name. This is the local global conjecture. This is the local global conjecture for Apollonian circle packings. Is that, um, well, what else could go wrong? Uh, for example, if you have, a, let's, let's say the number three mod 24 is admissible for this Ben set, but, a, but there is no three here because a circle of radius three would be way too big, a circle of radius one third would be way too big on the scale of this packing. Okay, so um, there's, there's also a local obstruction at infinity, uh, which the, so the full local global conjecture would say, uh, fix P, fix an integral uh, Apollonian circle packing, Apollonian packing P. Um, let's let's give a name. Let A, which is A of P, be the set of admissible numbers, admissibles. Then um, every sufficiently large, large admissible arises in the bend set, arises in the bend set. Okay, so these should be the only obstructions. Uh, you have the local obstructions, mod Q for some Q, and then um, you have the admissibles. In the case of the classical Apollonian circle packing, Elena Fuchs's thesis uh, showed that you could take Q to be 24. So 24 being two cubed times three, these are the only primes at which strong approximation for the Zariski dense group, which is the symmetry group of the Apollonian packing, whatever all that means. Um, these are the primes for which uh, you do not you're not fully onto the um, the mod P or the or the, better yet the piatic um, orthogonal group preserving a certain quadratic form. There, there's some stuff that's going on here that I hope to get to a little bit later. But anyway, so we know it, it seems like admissibility is a hard condition. You're, you need to check that you're in the bend set for all Q. That you're in the bed set mod Q for all Q. But actually, it's a it's a, a finite check and, and a very simple uh, quick one for any given uh, packing. So admissibility is easy. Uh, sufficiently large, well, that depends on the packing. Again, you could start with packings that have that are have smaller and smaller initial uh, bends, initial curvatures. And so, um, but in, in principle, this is a, a, I don't know. The question is how, the next question to me is how falsifiable is this conjecture? Maybe you just haven't gone far enough out to see what's going on. But again, uh, given the previous theorem, where is the previous theorem? Here, the number of circles, in other words, bends with multiplicity, is x to a power greater than one. And so the reason you might expect this kind of thing, if we look at all circles, all circles with bend less than x, so this is, this is some set, and uh, the, number of, the number of these is x to the 1.3, and then we take the bend, so we take the projection to, to the integers. Here's the, the integer line of size x. And the question is, do we hit what's the fiber of, of this, this map from, from circles in the packing to bends? And um, so a typical fiber, typical fiber would it would you would expect you is expected to have multiplicity. Well, if you're going to hit every number from, from 1 to x, or at least every admissible number, which again is a finite set of arithmetic progressions, then a typical fiber should have multiplicity. If there's x to the 
circles, then each bend you would like to have multiplicity uh, x to the 0.3. In other words, x to the delta 0.3 here is, is meant to represent delta minus one. Okay, this is just from the most naive box counting type argument. Any questions so far? So far, so good. Um, and uh, so, so this is the local global conjecture. Delta does not depend on the packing. Delta doesn't depend on the packing for classical Apollonian circle packing. So, so this number delta is, uh, is uh, they're all, as I said, there's one complex structure on the Apollonian, on the classical Apollonian circle packing, which has its own Hausdorff dimension. In a minute, I'll show you that this is just uh, one of infinitely many such things, and they will each have their own unique Hausdorff dimension. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, okay, and so so the best known uh, today is uh, an old theorem with Bergan from I guess seven years ago now, which says um, almost almost all admissibles arise. In other words, if we look at how many bends there are up to X relative to how many bends there should have been up to X, in other words, the number of admissibles up to X, this ratio goes to one. In fact, with a power savings rate, but, but never mind. The set B can miss some elements congruent mod Q, some small elements that are congruent, that are in the admissible set mod Q. Yes, there'll be congruence restrictions. Although there are some, uh, there are uh, some universal packings, packings for which the set of admissibles is the entire, uh, is all is all integers. Okay, so um, so this is the, the the kind of the best we currently know in this setting. Um, right. Let me say just a word about what goes into the proof of these things. So this is by the circle method, or what we call the orbital circle method, the orbital circle method, which is to say the circle method, but applied to group actions instead of just polynomials giving you the points on some variety, and you're trying to uh, you're trying to understand some kind of local global principle. The major arcs, the major arcs are handled by, uh, so infinite volume automorphic forms. So automorphic forms, automorphic forms and representations, um, infinite volume spectral theory and, uh, and the theory of expander graphs. So expanders, expanders and super approximation Uh, infinite volume analogs of the Ramanujan conjectures, these are all uh, synonymous uh, things. Um, does the set of admissible bends have density zero and Z? No, the set of admissible bends is just a, a finite list of arithmetic progressions. So there's, there's some arithmetic progressions, there's some numbers mod, the, there's a finite list of numbers mod 24, and the, the admissibles are the numbers that are fall into one of those classes mod 24, in the case of the classical packing. Yeah, so it's a finite, it's a, it's, uh, yeah. By the way, I should say the positive density, the fact that, um, let me uh, aside, the fact that the number of bends up to X is at least some constant times X was proved by Brigand and Fuchs. Also about a decade ago. Okay, so we, we've known for some time that a positive proportion of integers arises the fact that 100% of admissible numbers arises is uh, currently the best, the best we know about this. Uh, for the minor arcs, for the minor arcs, uh, we use um, maybe more standard analytic techniques. So uh, analytic number theory techniques, analytic number theory, uh, cancellation in exponential sums, exponential sums, Klosterman and, and so on, exponential sums, and cancellation. Okay.
So this is kind of uh, old news. I want to get to new news. We're not ready for this picture yet. Okay. Any any questions so far? Doesn't the positive density follow from the existence of Ford circles? Uh, no. So uh, the Ford circles. Great question. The the Ford circles will have. Um, the Ford circles are the analogs of circles. In fact, this will be important to what I'm about to say. The Ford circles will be the circles, the analog of Ford circles in this picture are the circles that are tangent to two uh, circles. So the values of these, this 278, 203, 135, and so on that you see here, uh, 47, 27, 23, 35, these are the circles tangent to two circles, and they are the values of a quadratic polynomial. So you'll only get square root the number of, uh, you'll, 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 in this way, and in fact, this is, this was observed already by Graham Lagarius Malas wilkes yen and implied, so I should put what was previously Graham Lagarius Malas wilkes yen exactly used the analog of the Ford circles to show that the number of bends up to x is at least square root x. Did I answer that question? Uh, or does that guarantee for the standard packing? No, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't guarantee. Even for the standard, by the standard packing, Senya means the, the, the packing that's the strip packing. I think that's what you mean by the standard, the standard packing. So the Ford circles would be the circles that are tangent to uh, this bottom line here. Uh, pardon my confusion, but does the set of admissible integers depend on the packing? Yes. Yes, so the, the set of bends, although there's a finite list, well, there's a finite subset of the numbers mod 24. So of course, there's a finite list of what the admissibilities can be. Okay, good, good. Yep, no worries. So um, in what, so there's a there's general, generalization of this. In fact, Saudi already observed so this is kind of the end of the story as far as, uh, as far as what I can say today about the classical Apollonian packing. And what about generalizations? Other, other packings. So already in uh, 1936, Saudi observed that the sphere packing, that there was a spherical analog, what I call the Saudi sphere packing, which is the analog of the Apollonian packing instead of starting with um, three tangent circles and inscribing one more, you can start with four tangent spheres, which uh, we can draw spheres as having a point at infinity. And so if we start with four tangent spheres, there's an obvious way, hopefully you can see, there's one ball that I can put, let's uh, stick to the color scheme. There's one ball that I can put in front of these, and there's another ball that I can try to put behind them. So, so that you get this configuration of four balls. And that's the analog of Apollonius's theorem in this setting. And uh, Saudi observed through explicit uh, construction, he actually built these things out of uh, metal, you know, steel ball bearings. He observed that there exist configurations like this. So this is a Saudi sphere packing. So it's a sphere packing uh, of balls in space, which uh, all have integer bends. So this is a circle of radius one over 28 radius one over 81, radius one over 85, and so on. And, um, and for this uh, Saudi sphere packing, the counting problem is again, uh, the counting problem is now solved in, in great generality for the for spheres in the packing. But what about the bends? So um, it was observed, I think by Boyd, I think Boyd in the seventies already observed that all the bends of this packing will be either, so instead of 24, now the modulus is three, and these are all one or zero mod three. So 28 is one mod three, 81 is zero mod three, 85 is one mod three. So the bends are all one, zero or one. In this, for the Saudi packing, of course, again, there's infinitely many uh, different rational configurations, but um, there, the, the bends are all zero or one mod three. That's the analog of the local obstructions. And here I was able to prove, I guess this came out last year, that uh, every, so given an integral Saudi packing, Saudi packing P, every 
sufficiently large uh, admissible, admissible now is the residue class zero or one mod three. Well, it might be zero or one, or for some packings, it might be zero or two. Those are the two possible uh, uh, values of the admissibles. Every sufficiently large admissible um, is represented, ap appears in the, is in the Ben set, is in the Ben set. So the full local global principle can be proved for uh, sphere packings. We still don't know it for circle packings. W one of the reasons, it's not exactly the reason, but one of the reasons is that the Hausdorff dimension is now uh, contains numbers. Well, this contains spheres. So the, the Hausdorff dimension will be at least two. Uh, and it's something like, I don't remember, 2.4. Something like, but it's less than it's less than three since three is the ambient dimension in which this fractal will live, and it's greater than two. And um, all right, so so that's kind of all we know about this classical these two classical objects: the the classical Apollonian circle packing, integral Apollonian circle packing, and the Saudi sphere packing. Any questions before we move on to generalities, generalizations? Okay, so far so good. So um, there were a number of generalizations that were observed uh, in work of Boyd. So there were generalizations uh, by Boyd, by Maxwell, by, uh, by a number of authors giving finite lists. So there were a number of finite lists, finite lists of packings, although it wasn't clear what packings even uh, was supposed to mean necessarily. Uh, with these integral structures, with integral structures. In some sense, this might go all the way back to, uh, as I'll show you in a second, um, here's a, a, an old paper of Bianchi. Bianchi, this is 1890s now. Um, this, is, this is from Bianchi's paper. And uh, he's starting to construct what uh, viewed in, in the right context will be what we now call the cube octahedral packing, um, which I've, I've reproduced here, what these part, parts of circles are. So here's a little bit of this, this red circle is, is here and so on. And, um, and this is how one can make uh, a, a packing out of it. So there were a number of, of generalizations, sort of ad hoc generalizations without, uh, th this was, we had lots of examples, but no theory. And um, so what I've been working on for the last many years is trying to understand what, is there a general theory to, so is there, is there a general theory which explains the existence of these objects. These objects and constructions. So that's what I would like to try to explain today. So um, yeah, by the way, I, I should mention there, there are more examples more recently made by uh, Baragar, um, Stang and her collaborators, uh, Senya Shedwasser, uh, studied by Xin Zhang, and there's forthcoming work of uh, Edna Jones on uh, analogs of, of this local global theorem in sphere packings. Okay, so what's the, what's the general theory? So let's give a definition. So by a sphere packing, what's a sphere packing? First of all, a packing, a packing P of, uh, we can say um, Rn union the point at infinity. What I really want, um, this is R, this is space plus, this is the Riemann sphere. I mean, this is the Riemann sphere. We, we can also think of this as the boundary of hyperbolic N plus one space, as you'll see in a second. A packing, uh, by a packing P, what I mean is, is an infinite collection of spheres. So these will be SN minus one spheres or N minus one spheres um, with two properties. 
One, I want those spheres to, uh, to have disjoint interiors. So with disjoint interiors, disjoint interiors, so they in order to have interiors, they need to be oriented. So oriented spheres, which means if you like, uh, if you prefer, you can think of it as balls um, or discs. So uh, spheres with disjoint interiors and the, I want those, the, the discs to be, and the balls to be dense. The balls, balls on the spheres, balls bounded by the spheres, uh, this, the set of balls are dense in Rn. In other words, if I take all of the spheres in the packing and I take the, uh, the balls that the spheres um, generate, these will have closure equal to all of Rn. So there's no space missing. All right. And again, a packing is integral. P is integral if every sphere in the packing has integer bend. The bend of the sphere is an integer. And we can generalize this to number fields uh, in certain ways, but not, not certain other ways. Let me add one more page. Add a page. Good. Okay. Now, as stated, there's going to be no structure. There's nothing we can do with this because uh, you just start, if you want to study integral packings, you just make a, a circle with radius 1 over 27 and another circle of radius 1 over 100 and another circle of radius uh, 1 over a million. And you can fill up space in this way. And there's nothing that one can say about which bends arise, how many spheres there are, and so on. So the structure, so without more structure, without more structure, there is little that we can say, little to say. So the structure that I will impose, so key definition, key property of all of these things is the following. A packing, a packing P is called Kleinian. if there exists a group gamma, which is called a symmetry group, gamma is a subgroup of the isometries of hyperbolic space in one higher dimension. So packing P is called Kleinian. If there exists a Kleinian group, a group acting uh, by isometries, which is discrete, geometrically finite. This means there's a fundamental domain uh, who's, so that an epsilon thickening of it has um, finite uh, volume. Um, the convex core has, uh, an epsilon thickening of the convex core um, has finite volume. So if there's a group that's discrete, geometrically finite, such that, the limit set of gamma, so the set of limit points, is exactly the set of limit points of the packing. So let me give you a um, sort of a definition by example. So again, let's go back to let's go back to the very first thing, which is the Apollonian packing. And I drew here a Coxeter diagram. So I'm going to redraw this Coxeter diagram. This this is meant to be the grand matrix of the corresponding Coxeter diagram. Let me show you how to how to interpret these things what they're supposed to mean. So example. So here's the diagram again. There was a thick wall, a single, a single, and a thick again. So this is the Coxeter diagram. And um, let's label these walls. So this is wall one, two, three, four, five. So a thick wall means um, multiplicity infinity. Uh, which means that the two walls, the dihedral, the, the edges are meant to be dihedral angles. So the nodes, nodes correspond to walls or roots, simple roots, if you prefer that language, um, walls of reflective walls. So Coxeter diagrams are supposed to tell you about reflection groups, reflective walls. 
and the edges edges tell you the dihedral angles dihedral angles between walls so this single uh, edge is meant to tell us that the walls meet at dihedral angle pi over 3 the fact that there is no edge from 1 to 3 there's no edge no edge means that they're orthogonal it means that the walls meet at a right angle and so uh, and what is so how do you meet at angle uh, infinity Th these two are tangent at infinity these two are tangent at infinity in other words they're they're um, parallel so so let's start with walls one and two so wall one will be this wall wall two will be this wall Walls four and five are also tangent because they have an infinite line. And wall four is orthogonal to walls one and two, and so is wall five. So it's pretty easy to guess that walls four and five will be um, vertical lines. So, so far, all we have is a square. Walls two, walls one and two, and walls four and five uh, generate this, this square. Now, what about wall three? So wall three will be orthogonal to walls one and five, I can draw that as a circle centered at the point of intersection of, of wall one and five. And I want it to intersect two at angle pi over three. Cosine of pi over three is a half. And so if I go twice the distance to wall two and I draw that circle, this will be circle three. This is wall three. Okay. So wall three is orthogonal to walls one and five as desired. There's no edge between walls one and five. And it meets wall two at angle pi over three. And similarly, wall four, it also meets at angle pi over three because this is a square. And so what you should, what this image really represents is the following. If we take everything, so this is the, this is the complex plane, really the Riemann sphere, which is the boundary of hyperbolic three space. So this is the, the first Bianchi group, it turns out. If we take this to the Poincaré extension, hyperbolic three space, so I'll draw a wall one here, wall two here. So this was wall one, this was wall two. Wall three, uh, rather wall four um, is in front and wall five is on, the, on this axis. So these are walls four and five. And then I have wall three, which is this, sphere so hopefully you'll you can see that there's this uh intersection of these walls and then this familiar diagram which is a double cover of um so the group the group gamma which is generated by reflections in walls one through through five is commensurate with the classical bianchi group sl2 of the gaussian integers so all of that, all of that information is um, hidden inside this Coxeter diagram. Okay, does that make sense? And here's the key observation for uh, wall one is what we call isolated. This is isolated, which means it doesn't intersect any other walls except orthogonally or at infinity. And so the the yoga is if you have an isolated wall, so let me call this gamma tilde. So let's take the group generated by the other walls, the non, the other walls, walls being wall two, three, four, and five. And let's look at the limit set of this, of this group gamma. So I'm taking this sub diagram, which is the walls two, three, four, five, and I'm not taking the inversion in wall one. And let's see what is the limit set of this, of this thing. So hopefully this will work. So again, this is wall two, three, uh, sorry, four, five, and three. So these are the walls that you see on the ground. Inversions in these walls correspond in the Poincaré extension to inversions in the geodesic domes. These are geodesic hemispheres. And in the case of straight lines, they're just Euclidean inversions. So I, I start with some arbitrary point in the upper half space, and I start moving it by the walls. So, so here I inverted through one of these walls, maybe wall four or something. 
And then from here, I'm just at random going to do some move and invert invert in, uh, it turns out this geodesic sphere will invert me into there. Okay, and if we keep doing this for a long time, we will get a limit set. So let's see if you can see this. So again, we started with this one wall and we started moving it around more and more and more. And we're getting some limit points in the boundary. And those limit points, hopefully you see, so the limit set of gamma is exactly the classical Apollonian packing. My pen is having trouble, I think, because of the, the video that's running. So let me um, move away from the video and hopefully it'll restore uh, this thing. But any questions so far? So this is the key property of the Apollonian packing. It's that it occurs, it arises as the um, limit set of some geometrically finite group acting in hyperbolic space. Sorry, I must, uh, I, I'm a bit confused. So do you mean the three-dimensional picture? Or, I mean, I'm not sure. Do you mean that I should be looking at the projection to R2 or like? Exactly. The limit set will be in the boundary. The limit set is, is there are no limit points because it's discrete. Because the group action is discrete, the only place where you get accumulation is at infinity, at the boundary at infinity. I see. Okay, good. Thank you. So, so that's why we can draw these pictures in the plane uh, in the case of hyperbolic three space. Are we applying infinite words to some arbitrary starting point? Yes, we're, we're applying, we start with some point and then you just apply letters at random. And when I apply those letters at random, what you really, what, well, that's what the image is illustrating. What the limit set is actually is take all the, take the entire orbit all at once and look at the set of limit points. There are no limit points in the upper half space itself. The limit points are only in the boundary. So where are they? Uh, they these are all dots, but hopefully you see that the dots in the end make up Here's the Apollonian packing uh, uh, appearing uh, after infinitely many steps. Changing the starting point changes the orbit, but does not change the limit set. Yes, exactly. Does the Hausdorff dimension have constraints other than a um, uh, great question. So in the case of Schottky groups, there's uh, old work of Philip Sarnak uh, and others that shows that the Hausdorff dimension will not be allowed to get close to n, can't get close to the maximal dimension. But um, for general packings, in fact, we can produce uh, our sort of arbitrarily close Hausdorff dimensions to n. To n minus one, I'm not sure I never really tried. In fact, isn't that an open conjecture about uh, the classical Apollonian circle packing being the packing with um, being the, the dimension closest to one that one that one can get. Okay, so I only have, let's see, I have about five minutes left. Is that, is that right? So let me try to state some, some theorems about this and then uh, tell you what we can say. So, um, so what can we say? So uh, we've defined these, these Kleinian packings. So a subclass of the packings so definition uh, packing P is not only Kleinian, but crystallographic. Crystallographic if this symmetry group is uh, finitely generated by reflections, which means that it's geometrically finite. So groups that are generated by reflections are the easiest to illustrate, and they're exactly the ones that one can write down a Coxeter diagram for, for a general uh, uh, geometrically finite group, I don't know a good way to, to represent it. Um, but in the case of reflection groups, we can really uh, draw such, such pictures. And so that is what um, these things are meant to illustrate. So this is the classical Apollonian packing when I take this vector to be isolated. Here's the uh, Saudi sphere packing. This is a Coxeter diagram, which uh, gives uh, a lattice, which is um, the group minus three, I'm running out of letters, u squared. So this is uh, the orthogonal group 
the orthogonal group of this quadratic form, the integer orthogonal group of this quadratic form, which has signature 4, 1, acts on hyperbolic uh, four space. So this acts on hyperbolic four space. And in fact, is this reflect is the reflective group given by this Coxeter diagram? It has an isolated vector. If I take the sub diagram and I take the group gamma generated by reflections in these walls, it will produce the classical Saudi picture. And uh, more generally, so um, in a paper with uh, Kei Nakamura, Nakamura that came out last year, we, uh, we studied packings um, generated by polyhedra. And the polyhedra packing, it turned out that this, this is the cube octahedral packing. This is the cube octahedral packing. And um, it also arrived, this is the Coxeter diagram for the Bianchi group SL2 Z adjoin root minus six, which is exactly the one I was showing you in Bianchi's paper. So this is the Coxeter diagram. And if you take the wall uh, one, which is isolated, then the inversion in the others is exactly what this picture is supposed to illustrate, which is this packing. And there's one more that I'll show you, which is this 14 dimensional packing coming from work of Vinberg. We have constructions of up to um, 18 dimensional packings. So this vector is isolated, isolated and gives a 14 um, a, a dimensional packing, integral packing. Not only integral, but super integral. So I have to give you one more definition and then I can state the main theorem and um, maybe we'll end there. So one more definition, all of the packings that we've seen so far, not only are integral, so definition, I have to tell you uh, one, two more things. A packing given, given a packing P, let P tilde be the super packing. So this is called the super packing. What you do is you take the packing and you act on it by inversions in the packing itself. So in other words, if we start with the classical Apollonian packing, so here's the packing. In fact, this, this has nothing to do with the, um, any other structure, actually. What we do is we take inversions in the spheres of the packing and let that act on the packing itself. So if I invert the entire packing through this sphere, I get an Apollonian packing inside of here but I, I'm allowed to continue acting on, on all of the, um, take the entire orbit. So I just get circles inside of, of circles and so on. So this is called the super packing, the super packing of P. And definition, P is super integral, not just integral, but super integral, if every sphere, not just in the packing has been that's an integer, but every sphere in the super packing has integer band, okay? So the classical Apollonian packing has this property, the Saudi packing has this property. Um, not all, so uh, there exist integral, but not super integral, non-super integral packings. This was, uh, this, this was given by Nakamura and myself. So here's, I can state the, the main theorem. Theorem, if a packing is Kleinian and super integral, so this, this is joint work with uh, Misha Kapovich from this year. Uh, if a packing is Kleinian and super integral, then um, the group generated by its symmetry group, so it's Kleinian, so it has a symmetry group, and the group of inversions and all reflections of spheres in the packing itself. So this, this group is a lattice, acts on hyperbolic n plus one space with finite covolume, and not only is a lattice, is, uh, and it's Q arithmetic. So it's an arithmetic group, arithmetic 
defined over Q and non-uniform. So the, um, it's Q arithmetic of simplest type, which means it's defined by quadratic forms and it's non-uniform. Conversely, conversely, every Q arithmetic of simplest type non-uniform quadratic form, uh, equivalently every O F Z, where F has signature uh, N1, F is defined over Q has signature N1 and is isotropic, isotropic over Q, every, every such thing is commensurate to, is commensurate to, this, this object is called the supergroup, supergroup. The supergroup of a super integral Kleinian packing. A super integral Kleinian packing. So this uh, hopefully explains what I was trying to get at before, uh, an understanding of where does the Apollonian packing come from? Where did this Saudi packing come from? We had these couple of examples and um, in the greatest generality, it's just from the theory of arithmetic uh, groups. So anytime you have uh, Q arithmetic, uh, non-uniform uh, hyperbolic group, then one can construct, in fact, not just one, but infinitely many, inf uh, infinitely many conformally inequivalent um, super integral Kleinian packings out of it. So uh, that's my time. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>